Good morning and welcome to the Lakers Lowdown. I'm Anthony Irwin. Today on the show, well, the Lakers went 4-0 in their group uh, in this in-season tournament thing. And their reward for it is a fifth game against the Phoenix Suns. And if you win that one, you win again after that, you get a free extra game that doesn't mean anything. Woohoo! Let's go! <sighs> I I think I have now reached the point where I have gotten so much negative feedback to not being over the moon over this thing that I'm like planting the flag in this take or whatever. And I think that some of that's probably going on because I'm just a very stubborn person. Those of you who have been listening or talking to me on this podcast long enough will know or, you know, we're probably nodding right now. Yeah, 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 Anthony, you're pretty freaking stubborn. So I think a lot of that is going on, but like, I, I don't know. My problem with this, this tournament, this whole time has been, what is the incentive to win it? Why should I care? And so far, all that the Lakers have gotten out of this is a fifth game against a top five team in the league. And then if you win it, <laughs> a bunch of super duper rich people get richer. Cool, I guess. And then, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then you play an extra game that like the stats don't even count really. I it's just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'll ever really get it. Um, my favorite thing recently has been every time a close game happens during the in season tournament, everyone's like, see, see the in season tournament is doing its thing. And I'm like, you know, you guys know that like close games happen before this, right? Even in the regular season, like you, Entire games have gone to multiple overtimes in the regular season. <laughs> well before this thing even started. It's like, oh man, the intensity, the intensity. You'll just never get the intensity. I'm like, I don't know, man. I've watched plenty of Christmas Day games that feel pretty intense. I've seen division games that feel pretty intense, even in November. It's crazy, right? So look, I, I, if you like it, cool. Not going to tell you you're an idiot for liking it. I just, I, I, I just keep bumping on what feels like a very PR like push from the NBA to get everybody to be like over the moon for this thing. And I just, I can't get there. <laughs> I can't now look if the Lakers win it or whatever. I am definitely calling that the 18th banner and they have one up on the Celtics from here on out. If the Celtics win it, I'm calling it a fake banner, though. And it, 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 at which point, like, I don't need an extra thing for those annoying fans to, like, say, you know, to put them above the Lakers. Like, if, in, in, in that case, this whole thing freaking backfired and it all sucked. Um, <laughs> but it was also funny to see them before the game, the Celtics, right? Before the game, Jason Tatum was talking about how point differentials force teams to do things that kind of, um, fly in the face of like unwritten rules in the league, and then guess what they're doing? <laughs> guess what they they wound up doing here? Um, as they needed to up their point differential, they were hacking Andre Drummond late in the game to get themselves a few extra points in that point differential. So, like clearly, they they sure cared about those uh, those unwritten rules. It it just is what it is. Uh, and and you know it's produced some fun moments, but I don't know that it has done anything out of the ordinary to produce those fun moments. Now back to the Lakers. I want to talk in this one about the Lakers offense, some issues that they're having this season. And, um, you know, seeing as he is probably going to be a very popular name over the next couple of weeks, especially if the Lakers continue to struggle offensively, I guess we'll talk about Zach Levine. We have almost made it to December. By the time you guys are listening to this, it'll be November 29th. I am recording this at like midnight my time uh, on November 29th, which uh, is close-ish, right? A couple weeks, and the D'Angelo Russells of the world can be traded. So we'll talk a little bit also about uh, Zach Levine, what it might take, some of the rumors that are kind of swirling around it. I'm hearing some you know, kind of 
uh, contradictory uh, either reporting or things that I'm hearing also. So we'll uh, we'll dive into that as well. Let's start with the Lakers offense. And I did all access Lakers tonight or last night um, with Aaron and with Mike Trudell. And they, you know, they were doing the whole like, oh, anybody who's criticizing the Lakers are are therefore uh, saying that the sky is falling. I do think there are some things that are worth, you know, being a little nervous about, a little worried about. Uh, but I, I by no means think that the sky is falling. I think the Lakers have done just fine given all of the injuries and given um, the attempt at implementing this this uh, five out system and how difficult that can be because of those injuries. I, I think there's a lot going on here, and I think all of that needs to be taken into account. That said, it was a decision by this coaching staff to implement that se- that 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 system, this five out system, and um, you know, we can maybe start to wonder if that was a wise move. I've always thought it was a little weird that you know the thing that the Lakers were ranting and raving all throughout media day was continuity and and how important and how vital that is going to be to getting off to a good start here. And the Lakers are off to an okay start. Um, not exactly lighting the world on fire, but also like not digging themselves a hole either. Uh, so that's, you know, it is, I guess, what it is. But, you know, when you implement this brand new system, it takes away any and all continuity that you could have potentially built with or built on Heading into this year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that is some of what is going on here. The other thing, too, is does five out actually fit the Lakers personnel? In some ways, yeah. In some ways, no. I think some players are actually made worse because of this five out per, uh, system and, and because of the way that the Lakers are operating offensively. I think it has looked extra clunky because LeBron and AD want to play a certain way that isn't necessarily the the system that the coaching staff is trying to <laughs> implement. So I yeah, I think that's the all of that is going on at the same time. But I do think that there are a, a couple stats here that do make me a little nervous as we uh as we as we reach kind of the quarter point of the season. First and foremost, the free throws. Last year, when the Lakers went on their crazy run, um, they were shooting way more free throws than everybody. And, you know, I asked Tradell about that on, on All Access Lakers last night. And his response was, well, the Lakers were playing so much harder than everybody because they were so desperate to get into the play-in tournament, right? And eventually into the playoffs. And then once everybody was starting to play like that again, you started to see that, edge kind of dissipate a little bit i think there's uh, that's i think objectively true that said i I do think five out um with uh, you know with a roster that doesn't have any real piercing drivers like even lebron will will pierce the perimeter shell but he usually does so through brute force right it is a lot of you know just stick your shoulder or get a shoulder past somebody. And that is how you're now in the key. And, you know, D'Angelo Russell, not really a, a, the the kind of guard who can just get by somebody on his own. Austin Reeves. I think the whole reason he is struggling um, with pressure, the way that he is so far this year has a lot to do with the fact that he isn't that kind of an athlete either. Gabe Vincent has a little of that to the to his game, but I, even there, I didn't really see it as is in the way that I was hoping um, during the, the the preseason. And I still have no idea when that guy is going to be available. So, you know, five out. Like at some point, penetration has to come from somewhere. And so far, the Lakers, you know, the way that they're doing it is by setting a ton of screens. Right, Anthony Davis is leaps and bounds ahead of everybody basically right now in terms of screen assist, which is great because I think that makes him a more effective player in some ways, but it also kind of turns him somewhat one dimensional. Right. And I think with all of those screens um, and with all of his offense coming off of those screens, it has messed with some of his rhythm throughout the course of a game. 
Um, and, and, but, but like, it's all the Lakers can do right now because again, D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves aren't those kinds of guards that just get by people, right? We're going to talk about Zach Levine here in a bit. And that is kind of the one thing that he would bring that I think would legitimately help the Lakers. Um, but you know, the free throws are a concern and then, well, all right. If you aren't shooting a ton of free throws, surely you're getting up threes at a decent rate. Nope. Per 100 possessions, the Lakers are actually shooting fewer three-pointers than anybody in the league. Those numbers may have updated uh, after last night's action. I, I The last time I looked at that stat was as of, you know, when the games were starting last night. And at this point in the season, you will see some swings or whatever. But still, like, either the Lakers are the worst or one of the worst in in this regard and you know at some point the math starts to to concern you a little. The, the the next kind of thing that also makes me a little nervous here is uh all right you're not hitting threes you're not making free throws well surely you're getting some offensive rebounds right to even out that math nope the lakers right now uh, as of when i'm reading this sit at 29th with only eight offensive rebounds per 100 possessions this season. Uh, so, like, that is really difficult to overcome all of that math on a nightly basis. And I think that is what is leading to feeling like, well, you're beating the shit out of, like, bad teams, but then really struggling against better ones, right? <clears throat> and I know that I got some flack for saying that or merely pointing out that, hey, uh, Darius Garland only played 14 minutes in the game that you're considering like considering the, 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 the big win this year. You say maybe it's the Clippers, but they've been a mess this year. Uh, you know, you beat the Rockets. That was, I think, a legit win against a pretty good team, but they aren't like a world beater this year either. So, yeah, like the, 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 the real like, you know, the wins that you would hang your hat on just don't really exist. And then, you know, look, beating the crap out of bad teams is good, right? Like, you have to do that if you're going to compile enough wins to be in the postseason. But, you know, when you look at that that stat profile, right, you're not getting to the free throw line, you're not shooting threes, and you're not creating extra possessions, uh, you know, by way of offensive rebounds. And then on top of all of that, let's see, let's look at their uh, turnover number as well. And yeah, they're, they're uh, turning the ball over more, you know, they're, they're uh, turning the ball over 15 times a game, which is 22nd worst in the NBA, right? So you're also not being very efficient there either. And again, that stat profile paints a picture that a quarter of a season into it becomes kind of difficult to ignore. And, you know, some of this might be improved, I guess, by getting some guys back, but like your turnover issue, that's not a Jared Vanderbilt, Rui Hachimura, Cam Reddish issue. Maybe somewhat Gabe Vincent because he'll have some more minutes out there and you have like one extra ball handler out there who may not turn the ball over as much. So maybe he helps with the turnovers, the threes, I guess maybe Gabe helps there somewhat. Not really, though. The guys who are going to be knocking down your threes or taking most of your threes, they've been available. Um, the offensive rebounding, okay, Jared Vanderbilt would help there, and Rui Hachimura would help there, but he hasn't missed a ton of time this year. So, yeah, that, like... <laughs> I, again, I'm not saying that the sky is falling. I'm saying that that stat profile is enough to like kind of make you wonder, all right, what what is going right here? And, you know, again, and I, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this because I think there are aspects of the five-out system that can be good if kind of mixed in well. The only thing is, like, what, we, what we've learned about Darvin Ham is he sucks at nuance. Like, he is not... If he's going to be doing something, he is going full bore in that one thing, right? All right, we're going to play small. We're going to play Austin Reeves at center. We're going to play big. We're going to play three centers. Like, it is not – you don't find very much in, like, the middle here with uh, with, with Darvin Ham. 
Um, and that's what makes me a little nervous here as he implements five out is like, all right, we are either going to go all five out or we're going to go all four in if four out one in, or we're going to go all Princeton and we're going to all these things. I'm like, okay, sounds exhausting, but all right. But you know, you look at some of the issues that the Lakers are having here, five out. Well, that's not going to help you rebound. If everybody's standing at the three point line. You would think that five out would help you shoot more threes, but what it's mostly led to is a lot more operation in the mid range. And it's not ideal because the Lakers don't have a ton of elite mid range jump shooters. Uh, you know, turnovers when the ball is kind of moving around the perimeter as much as it is. And, uh, you know, that might lead to some turnover issues too. So I, I just, you know, I wasn't positive about this five out and now, you know, you're 17 games into the, into this 18 games into the season. And you know, you're two, two games away from the quarter mark. And at some point you really have to start looking at the scenes like, all right, is this, is this an effort worth embarking on or continuing, right? Implementing this and overcoming all of those injuries to run a system that I'm not positive is the best thing for the Lakers. And again, it's like I talked to Raj about on, on all access Lakers yesterday. Um, or, you know, the last time we, I was on there, I, you know, five out is very much the kind of thing that you use to ignite the shooting of a Torian Prince of an Austin Reeves of a D'Angelo Russell, right? And allow that to really space the floor for Anthony Davis and LeBron James. But through a combination of those guys just not talking, knocking down the shots that they need to, and defense is just still not caring, even if they do, because at the end of the day, you're not going to like not shade away from Anthony Davis or LeBron James. Uh, that has kind of led to an offense that has mostly been kind of stuck in the mud. So I, We'll see what things look like as guys get healthier. And um, it, reports are right now that Cam Reddish is going to probably play tonight in Detroit. Um, and then hopefully in the next few days, we'll get some kind of an update on Jared Vanderbilt that he would be nearing a return as well. And, you know, Rui is supposed to be reevaluated in a week after he fractured his nose. And, you know, again, like once once the team looks a little healthier and you aren't getting first quarter Jalen Hood Shafino minutes, by the way, that pick, oof, as it stands right now, at watching Jaime Jaquez, <laughs> uh, again, and I'm a little biased here because, you know, what, watching a Mexican actually do things in the NBA has been really fun and it could have taken place on the Lakers, except the Lakers didn't even work them out. Um, instead, they took uh, Jalen Hood Shafino, who's, few minutes so far this year looked pretty bad and hasn't been available much otherwise so yeah um <laughs> hope that one works out but yeah this this kind of statistical profile would kind of lead someone to think all right well if this might not if those improvements in those in those stats might not happen internally where could you possibly see those improvements what kind of player do you need to bring in to help with those improvements and you know i guess that's why to some people zach levine is kind of sort of interesting let's be absolutely clear though like a big p a big part of the reason why people around the league really seem to think that zach levine is going to be a laker is because of the clutch dynamic. There is no getting away from that. That is always going to be a factor here. That is always going to be something that is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, and for good reason. It has mattered. That's why Cam Reddish is on the Lakers right now. It worked out. He has looked good this year, but the reason they brought him in was to revitalize his career and, and hopefully get himself a bigger contract after the season. Um, but, yeah, let's, you know, the, the, the Zach Levine thing, it's always going to matter that he is a clutch client he, wearing an LA shirt and a clutch or no, it was a clutch jacket or a clutch hoodie and an LA sh uh, hat when he was seen out in public with Rich Paul. Like that wasn't an accident, but all right. How does Zach Levine help with some of the things that we're talking about? Well, um, for everything that I said about the Lakers guards, D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, and to a lesser extent, Gabe Vincent, seeing as we 
I haven't seen him and may not see him again for a little while. Uh, Zach Levine is that kind of athlete who can just break down. Like if he's getting full court pressure, he's going right by that player and he's using that momentum as a runway whenever he gets into the paint. So, you know, that right there. And, you know, the, the analogy I would kind of uh, use here is you look at like a team that runs the football. Well, uh, that slows down blitzes, right? You always hear that phrase when you're watching these football games. Well, with so-and-so starting to run the ball a little well, that'll stop these uh, offense or defensive linemen from pinning their ears back and going after the quarterback because they have to worry about gap coverage um, so that the, you know, the, the, the running back in, in, in question here um, doesn't keep on hurting them for first downs every time he touches the ball. Um, and, and Zach Levine has that same kind of effect where if X guard on the other team keeps pressuring him way too high and he keeps going right by that guard to get into the paint and create, create problems otherwise, well, that's going to slow down some of that stuff, right? And and uh, some of that pressure. And, um, you know, in, in that regard, he would kind of help here. The other nice thing with, with uh, Zach in that penetration ability is it doesn't require AD to set as many screens as he has. And I do think we've hit kind of diminishing returns in AD setting so many screens because now you're seeing him set some screens here after like getting run into time and time and time and time again. Um, later in the game, you watch him set some of these screens and he's not making contact because setting screens sucks. <laughs> it, it just does. Uh, so, you know, with, with Levine, um, maybe not needing as many screens from, from AD when Davis does set those screens, maybe just maybe he actually makes contact uh, as the game goes on because he isn't so tired from setting them earlier in the, in, in the game. Um, so I think that would kind of help a little bit. Zach Levine, also a good shooter um, is a significantly better athlete than D'Angelo Russell. So like, like D'Angelo Russell, when we talk about him defensively, he's, you know, Aaron always uses this phrase, right? Scouts will ba basically talk about, you know, defenders in these terms where, you know, for explaining why defense isn't being played and a player might not be playing defense for one of three reasons. A, they can't physically B, they can't mentally or C, they just choose not to. Now Levine is in that third category and it does make me nervous to hope that somebody who already has a giant contract out in front of them, um, just turns it around defensively like that. It doesn't happen very often. Normally when you see somebody start to play better defense, it's because they see that their career and their next contract is on the line. I E cam reddish, right? As we've seen this season, but D'Angelo Russell though, cannot play defense physically. Like he just doesn't have the foot speed to guard opposing point guards. So at least with cam, Sorry, not not Cam. Um, at least with Zach, uh, there's a chance that like physically, or because he does have some of those physical uh, tools, that maybe just maybe he defends at a higher level than D'Angelo Russell has, um, not just this season, but over the course of his career. So <clears throat> maybe that's another kind of gamble that the Lakers would be making there. Apologies for my voice. It has been fine all night. I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't smoke, so it's not that. So I'm not. Let's get, let's just uh, get through this, I guess. But yeah, with um, with Zach, some improved penetration and maybe some better defense, but chances are probably not. Zach would also the Lakers. You look at their uh, you look at some of their other numbers here. Now transition points is not a uh, I don't believe that is play type. Let's see. Um. So I got to try to find, oh, here we go. Isolation, transition. So <clears throat> um, you're looking at, at the, the Lakers numbers here and uh, points in transition so far this season. The Lakers are, 
like middle of the middle of the pack, maybe slightly above average in terms of number of points that they're scoring um, per game or per hundred uh, per game in transition. So, you know, that's 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 a good number. And that's how you kind of even out some of the offensive deficiencies that they've had in the half court. Um, again, that, you know, they're there. And, and in terms of like number of opportunities, right. Um, the Atlanta Hawks lead the way with 23 in change uh, possessions per game in transition. The Lakers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, they're ninth with 20 possessions per game. And um, you know, in in those in those uh, possessions, they're generating 22 points. So you know, that's that's a, a decent number there. Or a pretty good number, I guess, <clears throat> for how they're operating in those uh, uh, possessions, right? So points per possession in transition. Um, again, middle of the pack, 1.1 basically there for the Lakers. Um, so Zach Lowe, <clears throat> God. Uh, Zach Levine is very much a transition player. He leaks out. He likes to dunk. He is super fast. He's a one-man um, fast break, basically onto himself. Not necessarily always the most efficient player because he's trying to do so much one-man fast break stuff, but he can at least kind of up the pace there in ways that uh, D'Angelo Russell just doesn't. Essentially, if Russell is participating in transition, it's usually as like a, a hit-ahead type of pass that, that gets the transition game going. And, you know, that is effective. That is important. But, um, you know, Levine just being faster would would help in in that regard as well. Um, and I also just kind of think that, um, man, how am I going to say this? I think that by bringing in a different player, like essentially the Lakers have to make a choice here pretty soon as it pertains to D'Angelo Russell, because I thought he was playing pretty good basketball at the beginning of the year. And then, you know, right when the Lakers hit a bit of a lull, you started seeing some of those trade rumors and his name is the first name mentioned. Um, as soon as those trade rumor rumors start and like, I'm on the trade machine here and, and on the trade machine that I'm, I'm, I, I use on fan spell, you look at the top 15 players whose names get, put in the trade machine <clears throat> leading the way right now is Zach Levine makes sense. Alex Caruso is number two also makes some sense. Weirdly Rashawn Holmes is three. Not really sure why the, the Mavericks like need him. DeMar DeRozan is four again, makes sense. Chicago is rebuilding. Evan Fournier is five also makes sense because the Knicks just aren't really using him. And then in comes D'Angelo Russell at sixth. And, and I do kind of think that that stuff wears on him. And I broke down with, with Harrison um, last Tuesday about how, like, over the course of his career, D'Angelo Russell has probably never felt all that committed to. He's gotten a ton of money, and at the end of the day, that might be the only commitment that really matters in the NBA. But, like, organizationally speaking, it's been a kind of a a, a train of – or, you know, teams and cultures that are just like, oh, yeah, you're here for a little bit. You'll give your money and then we'll ship you somewhere else. And, <clears throat> you know, when when he does that again here in L.A. And now for the second time, the Lakers are getting ready to trade him. Uh, not not like literally or not not in uh, not figuratively. Uh, the Lakers are like, you know, actually getting ready to trade D'Angelo Russell again for the second time. And, and I do kind of think that that kind of wears on him a little bit. So, you know, I think as much as the Lakers can, either they need to like go to him and say, Hey, you know, sorry, you have the most movable money on our books. You are the player that, you know, teams might be looking for in return. Uh, and as such, like this might just be how this plays out. Or they say, you know what, the offers that are being made for you are pretty ridiculous. Let's actually try to make this better for all of us involved here and really kind of push forward together. No matter how that plays out, 
I think at some point the Lakers need to kind of figure out with, with D'Angelo Russell and D'Angelo Russell needs to feel them figure it out. Um, you know, this, the, that, that kind of cultural reliance that I don't think he has felt much to, uh, this point. End of the day though, I, I really think that, you know, a lot of this just kind of comes down to playing better, getting healthier, playing better. And, and I think the Lakers can do those things. I think it still is a very talented roster. I think it's a roster that makes a lot of sense. I don't know that it necessarily makes sense for the system. Darwin wants it to make sense for, but eventually maybe you scrap the system or you go with a, a, a lighter diet of that system and you figure that out moving forward. But yeah, I, you know, the, the schedule is going to get a little bit easier and you can have a little bit more time with some of these pieces that you are implementing the system with and, and maybe you figure things out moving forward. So that is going to do it here for this episode of the Lakers lowdown. While I still have any voice uh, remaining whatsoever, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. A reminder, tonight I will be on All Access Lakers during Lakers Pistons, so check us out there. Playback.tv slash All Access Lakers is where you find that. Then right after the game, I will be right here, either in a lounge or in a lowdown to break down what we just saw there. And please, Lakers, I am begging. Please do not snap that losing streak for the Washington Wizards because the timeline will be un bearable and the subtweets from lebron will probably ruin my week ruin all of our weeks so please take care of business against this god-awful detroit pistons organization until then and until the next time you guys hear from me i'm anthony irwin saying have a great rest of your day make somebody else's and i'll talk to you tomorrow hopefully with a voice